All right, welcome back, folks. Today we're going to begin our discussion on the periodic table, and we'll start by talking about a gentleman named Dmitry Ivanovich Mendeleev. Now, Mendeleev uh, was born in uh, Siberia. I believe he was born in February of uh, 1834. Not an important fact to remember. He died in February of 1907. He became known as the father of today's modern-day periodic table. The method in which he arranged the elements is actually quite ingenious. Here's today's periodic table. We see this a lot, don't we, in our discussions. And here is Mendeleev's first periodic table. You don't see a lot of similarities at first, but in reality, this is quite remarkable. Notice that lithium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium are in the same column here. We have beryllium, calcium, strontium, barium in the same column over here. You'll also notice that there are no noble gases. In Mendeleev's time, the noble gases weren't discovered, so of course he couldn't include them in his periodic table. Now, the way in which he arranged his periodic table is quite interesting. What he did is he arranged the elements in order of increasing atomic mass. So he started, of course, with the lightest of all the elements, hydrogen. Let's see if we can get my pen working here. And after hydrogen, of course, comes helium. And we're going to ignore those two uh, just for the sake of uh, explaining this a little bit easier. We're going to start with lithium, which is the third, of, uh, the third heaviest element. Then beryllium, then boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon, then we have sodium, magnesium, etc. Now, what he did is he examined both the chemical and physical properties of these elements, and he noticed a cyclic pattern in their properties. Now, another word for a cyclic pattern is a periodic pattern. When we refer to the periodic table, we refer to a, to a table that shows cycles. Let me tell you what that means. Let's discuss the melting points of these elements. If I looked up the melting point of lithium, it turns out to be, in degrees Celsius, about 180 degrees C. Okay, beryllium is uh, close to 1300 degrees Celsius. Carbon has a melting point of 3500 degrees. Oh, sorry, I skipped one, didn't I? Uh, boron has a melting point of 2300 degrees Celsius. Now we can do carbon, 3500 degrees Celsius. And then nitrogen is negative 210. Oxygen, a bit cooler, negative 218. Fluorine, a bit cooler still, negative 220. And neon is the coolest so far at a negative 249 degrees Celsius. Now after uh, neon, the next heaviest element is sodium. And it has a melting point of 98 degrees Celsius. Considerable difference here. Then we hit magnesium, and it is 639. Now, at a quick glance, you're going to say, well, Hummer, those are just a, big, a bunch of numbers. They really don't make any sense. I don't see a pattern there. But take a look. Do you notice that beryllium is considerably higher than lithium? Boron is higher than ber the beryllium. Carbon is higher than boron. And then we get a big drop with nitrogen. Of course, nitrogen is a gas at room temperature. Then oxygen is lower. Fluorine is lower still. And neon is the lowest of them all so far. And then the next element, according to increasing atomic mass, is sodium, and it jumps up again. And magnesium is considerably higher than sodium. What would you expect the melting point of aluminium to be? Would you expect it to be higher than magnesium or lower? Well, think about patterns. Take a look at lithium on our periodic table. It's located on the far left. It had a melting point of, of 180, 1300, then boron 23, carbon 35, nitrogen negative 210, negative 218, negative 220, negative 249, then sodium, here we are, we're up again to 98, magnesium 639. What do you think about aluminum? If you said that it would increase, you are correct. Aluminium's melting point, we'll start it right over here, is 660 degrees Celsius. Silicon's melting point is 1410 degrees Celsius. Then we get a bit of a drop after silicon. We get phosphorus at 44 degrees Celsius. Now remember, earlier we had a P 
peak at carbon and then we had a drop at nitrogen. Once again, did you notice we had a peak at silicon and a drop at phosphorus? And argon, at the end of that row, we're going to put argon right over here, argon has the lowest melting point of the elements in that particular row at negative 189 degrees Celsius, just like neon did. Now the next element after argon, according to increasing atomic mass, is potassium, and you guessed it, it goes up again to 64 degrees Celsius. So do you see a cyclical pattern? The melting point begins to increase, it peaks at carbon, and then it slowly decreases at the lowest is in my 18th group. Then sodium, we start the trend over again, we peak at silicon, and the lowest is at argon, the 18th group. And of course, we start the process over again. We see a cycle. Mendeleev noticed this not just with melting points, but he also noticed it with boiling points. He noticed a cyclical property with densities, and he noticed specifically how they reacted with the elements chlorine and how they reacted with the, elements, the element oxygen, the ratio in which they reacted. And once again, we saw cycles. For instance, lithium reacts with chlorine in a one-to-one -one ratio. Beryllium, one-to-two. Boron, one-to-three. Carbon, one-to-four. You see an increase as we go across. Nitrogen, well, it's not perfect with chlorine, but we could say um, it increases again. We see it better in the third period. And the way in which they react with oxygen, we also see an increase as we go across each row of elements. So we see this cyclic nature. And Dmitry Mendeleev was the first to notice that and the first to publish that. Now, what also led credibility to Mendeleev's periodic table, if you take a look at it, there are certain gaps. Those gaps were left because the masses of those elements that were missing were, um, they went from one mass to a much higher mass, and uh, he left spaces in his periodic table saying that those elements would later be discovered and they would have these properties. Sure enough, the L's elements were later discovered and they had properties virtually identical to what Mendeleev had uh, predicted. One of those gaps comes with scandium on the periodic table and another is with germanium. They were later discovered after Mendeleev uh, created this periodic table and left spaces for them. Okay, let's get some vocabulary out of the word here, or out of the way here. In the periodic table, we will notice that the elements are arranged horizontally in numerical order according to atomic number. Mendeleev did it by atomic mass. That's not the best way to do it. We like to do atomic numbers now. The resulting seven rows are called periods. Each, with the exception of the first, begins with something called an alkali metal and ends with something called a noble gas. This arrangement forms vertical columns of elements which have similar chemical properties. These columns are known as groups or families. So let's take a look at my periodic table here. We have 18 different groups. We start with our first group, which includes hydrogen, lithium, and sodium, and so on. The metals in this group are called the alkali metals. Hydrogen is not a metal, so it's not included as an alkali metal, but it is included in group one. The second group, these are called the alkaline earth metals. It begins with beryllium, then magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, and at the bottom, radium. And then we have uh, group three. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, group 13, 14, 15, 16, group 17, these are called the halogens, and then finally group 18, these are called the noble gases. Now, the resulting seven rows we call periods. My first period begins with hydrogen and ends with helium. My second period begins with lithium, an alkali metal, and ends with neon, a noble gas. My third period begins with sodium, and ends with argon, once again beginning with an alkali metal and ending with a noble gas. And that happens with the rest of the rows on the periodic table. Now keep in mind these two bottom rows do not really count as individual rows. This row right here, the lanthanide series, begins in, uh, belongs in this box.
And this row right here, the actinite series, belongs in this box here. Of course, there's not enough room to squeeze them in there, so we add them at the bottom of the periodic table as footnotes. Now, the number of each period corresponds with the number of outermost energy levels that contain electrons for the element in that period. For example, those in period number one contain electrons only in the first energy level. Well, you guys knew that, didn't you? Hydrogen, 1s1. Helium, 1s2. They only have electrons in the first energy level. Those in row two contain electrons in energy level one and energy level two. Of course, you knew that. Lithium's configuration, 1s2, 2s1. Beryllium, 1s2, 2s2. And we can go all the way across to neon, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. So we have electrons in the first and second energy levels. Those in row 3 have electrons in the first, second, and third energy levels. Those in row 4 have electrons in the first, second, third, and fourth energy levels. And so on down the table. Now, there are some terms you guys should be able to define these on your own, but I'm going to quickly identify their locations on the periodic table. We did this earlier in the year. Metals are located, with the exception of hydrogen, on the left side of the periodic table. Now, the nonmetals then would be on the right side of the periodic table. And the metalloids are in between. Let me show you then on my periodic table. Okay? Let's take a look. If I were to draw a line beginning underneath boron and create a staircase, so then I go beneath silicon, then arsenic, then tellurium, and right between polonium and astatine. These elements over here on the right side are considered to be nonmetals. All of the others on the left side, with the exception of a few, are considered to be metals. Hydrogen is one of those exceptions. It's actually a nonmetal. We also have some metalloids. The metalloids are essentially on the staircase. I'm going to put a star by them or a dot by them on my periodic table. Boron is considered to be a metalloid. So is silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, and tellurium. And oftentimes, you will see some textbooks, it's not too common, they will call polonium and astatine metalloids also. But the ones that I just put a blue dot by are commonly referred to as the metalloids. Aluminum is considered to be a metal. Usually polonium is considered to be a metal and astatine would be considered to be a nonmetal. But like I said, sometimes they're considered to be metalloids. They're right on the staircase. These elements have properties that are similar to nonmetals as well as metals. Now the alkali metals are the group one metals. Now, of course, we can list those quickly. We have time today. That would be lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and the rarest of all elements, francium. They are the group one metals, and they are called the alkali metals. The alkaline earth metals are members of group two. Now, they include beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, and radium. So, we'll go ahead and list them. Beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, and radium. These guys are called the alkaline earth metals. The halogens belong in group number 17. And they would include fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and astatine. So fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and astatine. My handwriting's getting sloppy, isn't it? And we had already mentioned the noble gases. They are members of group 18. And they react with literally nothing at all. Now, it is true that some of the heavier noble gases, we can get to react with fluorine at high temperatures, but it's unusual that these elements will react with anything at all. They are helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon. All right, next up, groups. 
and I've used that term, I believe, already today. We said that groups are the vertical columns on the periodic table. Do you remember how many there were? If you said 18 of them, you are correct. Periods are the horizontal rows on the periodic table. Remember how many of those there were? If you said seven, you are correct. So the groups, one, two, three, four, all the way across to the noble gas group, which is group 18, and the periods, there are seven of them. Remember, these two on the bottom belong in these two boxes. The transition elements are groups three through 12, so if I go from scandium all the way through zinc. So these groups in the middle are called the transition elements. And the lanthanoids, also called lanthanides, um, I like to call the 4F elements. That means that they are filling up the 4F sublevel. And they include elements atomic number 57, lanthanum, all the way through atomic number 70, terbium. And the actinoids are the 5F elements. And they include elements actinium all the way through nobelium, atomic numbers 89 through 102. Now, when we pick up next time, we're going to talk about the periodic law, the octet rule, and we're going to discuss a couple of periodic properties. So, we'll see you in a bit. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.